Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our class. We begin tonight in the first chapter in the 20th verse, but before we do that, we're going to go back just a, just a couple, two, three verses. Go back to verse 17. I was reminded on my way going home last week that I overlooked any comment, whatever, upon what is sometimes a misunderstood thought. Paul says in verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Now what does it mean, from faith to faith? Well, there are three things I want to say about it. One is, the book of Romans emphasizes the system of salvation is a system involving faith. The second thing I want to say it could be that this is speaking of how our faith begins with our conversion and it grows and it goes from faith to a stronger faith. And many hold that view and you can find no fault with it. And there's still another and the word faith sometimes refers to the whole Christian system like in the book of Jude, we'll contend earnestly for the faith that holds the whole system of Christ. And sometimes the word faith refers to belief, that without faith or without belief, it's impossible to please God. So it could mean that the faith leads us to believe what we need to believe in order to be saved. I can't find any fault with that either. In fact, that is my preference, but that's not the preference of those who say they're smarter than I am. Now, that's where I don't have any preference. But nonetheless, these, the main thing I think we want to gather from that phrase is that this is a system of faith. The system of salvation involves faith. Not faith only, but faith. Now, having said certain things about the gospel being God's power unto salvation, in verse 20, the Apostle Paul addresses a fault that developed in mankind from the beginning. He said, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, that which is invisible, how do you see that which is invisible? Why, you see it by the evidence of it. Let me just give you a very simple illustration. How many of you saw the wind the other night? You didn't see the wind, but you saw the evidences of it. You see trees down everywhere and, you, and things all blown about. I had a number of trees down around my place, but I didn't see the wind. I think I may have told you once before, my Aunt Nell said only pigs could see the wind and I never did know how she knew that. <laughs> but nonetheless, we see invisible things by the evidence of them, don't we? And God is invisible. He is the invisible God because he is spirit, as Jesus says in John 4, 24. You don't see spirits but you see evidences of spirits and you see evidences of spiritual qualities. Now he says the, the invisible things of God are clearly seen, They're being understood by the things that are made. Well, what does that refer to? Well, that refers to our universe, our world, the things that have been created. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Those who disbelieve in the reality of the existence of God, they are without excuse. Why? God has given evidence by the things that he has created to show that he exists. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork I remember one time I had to have a little operation or a little thing done to my hand. And I was really impressed with that doctor that did it. 
because he was fooling with my hand and he said, you know, that's one of the most marvelous pieces of machinery and equipment you could possibly think. You just think of all the things that you can do with your fingers and with your hands. That is, so you get arthritis. But then, until then, you just, it's, it's a marvelous thing. And he said, and to think that that just happened? That was just an accident? He said, it's, in, it's inconceivable that could have just, just happened. It obviously had a designer and certain purposes behind it. And God has shown these things by the things that are made. Our universe, the immensity of it, the precision of it, the exactness of it, everything about it. I was just thinking today of two of the greatest blessings that we have. One of them is evaporation. What would we do without evaporation? I don't think the kitchen sink would ever get dry. It has to evaporate. And then another thing we think about, gravity. That's, just, that's, a, that's a law of God's nature. Isn't it wonderful that we have gravity? We don't have to float around in the sky. Things will be held down. And so many of these blessings, the rain, the sunshine, well, we could go on and on how that the heavens declare the glory of God, the stars, the moon, the seasons, all the things of creation. And to look at those evidences and say there's no God, why, there's no excuse for denying the reality of God. That's what Paul is saying here. Because that when they knew God, man knew God from the beginning. He just not only knew about God, Adam and Eve knew God. The people after Adam and Eve, they knew God. But because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Mankind began to worship the creature rather than the Creator, and notice their attitude toward themselves, professing themselves to be wise, where did they become? They became fools. Proverbs 14, 1 says, The fool saith in his heart, There is no God. He's not looking at the evidences that cannot be refuted. Now, because of that, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, idols. He turned to the worship of idols, turned to the worship of animals, turned from the worship of God. Now, what was God's reaction to them about this? Notice verse 24. Wherefore God gave them up. Now, when it says God gave them up, it didn't mean that he was no longer interested in them. He allowed them to do whatever they wanted to do. God does not force man to believe in him. God does not force man to obey him. We have to do that by our own personal individual decisions and choices. And when man is determined to turn to idolatry, to think himself wiser than God and to go his own way, God said, all right, you can do that. If that's the path you choose, I'll give you up to do that. He gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Notice what they did. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Well, I think that would be most foolish. Here is something that has been created and that which has been created, to think that that's greater than the one that created it. But that's when mankind did. Now, verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up. He allowed them to do their own thing gave them up the vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, 
men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or suitable. If there ever was a condemnation of homosexuality and lesbianism, you couldn't have it any plainer stated than what the Apostle Paul has said here. Now, why was that practice being done? They had abandoned God. They left God's standards. They let themselves be their own gods. They would decide what was right and wrong. They would do what they wanted to do, their own thing, whatever. God says, all right. If you, that's the path you want to do, but this is what characterizes those who will turn from God. Let me tell you something, folks. We see many things in our own society that are abominable and despicable. Why is that? Why does it seem to be growing? It's because more and more people are pushing God out of their lives and they're bringing in themselves, they're exalting themselves. They think they're so smart, but they're fools. And you don't want to be a fool and I don't either. We need to pay attention to what the Apostle Paul says. says now look at verse 28. And even if they uh, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate, that means a worthless mind, to do those things which are not convenient. That means things were not proper, not fitting. How many of you remember in uh, uh, Gone with the Wind? And Charlotte sometimes would do something and, and the uh, uh, mammy that it was waiting on her sometimes, she said, Miss Charlotte, that's just not fitting. That's just not fitting. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. There are certain things that they were doing, and it's just not fitting. Notice what they were doing. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, insolent inventors, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, in other words, they wouldn't keep their word, without natural affection, not even for their own children, implacable, they just couldn't live in peace, you just can't get along with them, unmerciful, look at all of those characteristics of those people who had left out God. Is that not in evidence in our own lives and our own society? Do we not see? We want to know why these things exist? Now, a lot of people think, well, we need to give more money. We need to give them better housing. Make sure everybody has a good job. Give them a free education. Give them all that. That isn't going to solve anything. It's going to have to be a change of heart in the people if they're ever going to do what's right. But here they had, had a change of heart for the worse, hadn't they? They had turned away from God. And this was the result. This is the kind of behavior that follows in the wake when people uh, push God out of their lives. And they did this knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only to do, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, a lot of people may not do certain things that are wrong, but vicariously, they sort of enjoy reading and hearing about other people doing things. And they sort of gloat about that and think that's sort of smart. Well, it's not. Those that commit these things and those that are proud of others doing these things, they are worthy of death. Indeed, they are dead spiritually. They are separated from God. Now, he's talking about the people, the population of mankind, and this has existed since the Garden of Eden all the way up to the time of Christ that he's writing here. He goes into chapter 2, and who does he address in chapter 2? Notice verse 17, it tells us who he's talking to. Behold, thou art called a Jew. Now he's talking to people who were of the Jewish race. Descendants of Abraham, 
of the chosen nation, those through whom the Messiah was to come. That's who he's going to be talking to in this second chapter. Now it's generally thought the first chapter was more directed to those of a godless Gentile background. But now he turns his attention to the Jew. And what does he say about them? Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for, for wherein thou dost judge another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that dost judge doeth the same things. Now here were the Jews. They had a relationship with God all down through the centuries. They had the written law of God and the law of Moses. And they were judging the Gentile. They were judging those that were involved in these wicked things that we've just read about. And they were condemning those things. And they were right to condemn them. But they weren't the right ones to do the condemning. Why? Because they were doing the same thing. Now, when a person condemns somebody, he ought not be doing what he's condemning. That, that's just not too smart. And, and that uh, fellow driving down the highway 80 miles an hour, and somebody passes him, and he said, why, look at that idiot driving so fast. Why, he's doing the same thing, 30 miles on, 80 miles, and he just got passed, and he didn't like getting passed. And so he, he does the same thing that he condemns. That's what the Jews were doing, notice. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now he's saying, Jew, you may have a Jewish background, you may be a descendant of Abraham, and you may think because of that you're among God's chosen people, but you do what you're condemning, God will condemn you as well. Notice, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment? Oh, they thought they was going to get away with it, but they're not going to get away with it. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? What was the manifestation of the goodness of God? Why, he didn't destroy them. He didn't kill them. He didn't wipe them off. He gave them opportunity and time to repent. And his goodness and his forbearance was to provoke them to repent. Not to think that what they were doing was all right. You know, God has to put up with so much. I don't see how he does it. We try to put up with a few things. We don't have anything to put up with what God has to put up with, I don't think. But God is forbearing. He's long-suffering. He is not quick to anger. He's slow to anger, but he will does have anger. And his wrath will be expended, and we'll see that as we continue to read. Verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, wrath against the day of wrath, or treasures up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Notice the phrase treasurest up. That means you heap up and accumulate and, and, and make a stockpile. Well, that might be all right if you're accumulating money and things like that. You treasure up certain things. But to treasure up and build a stockpile of the wrath of God toward you, is that a smart move? And that's what Paul says they were doing. They were treasuring unto thyself against the wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Well, this echoes the same thought we get in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, where we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, receive the things done in the body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. It's the same thing that we read further over here in the book of Romans, in Romans 
14.12 that the Lord's going to hold us accountable for our lives. Paul says he's going to render to every man according to his deeds. And notice the two groups that will be judged. The first group, to them <clears throat> who, who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, what do they have? Eternal life. And he skips down now with me to verse 10. He says, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. But now what about that other group? That other group in verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth. I just have to emphasize here, how many times in the book of Romans, Paul emphasizes to people the necessity of being obedient. Not only believe, but be obedient. And you can't be saved without being obedient. And so he says here, those that don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what's their fate? Indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first also of the Gentile. Notice his judgment's going to be on the Jew and the Gentile. And he says in verse 11, there's no respect of persons with God. He's going to judge men fairly. It doesn't make a difference whether he's a Jew or whether he's a Gentile. He's going to judge man according to what man has done and how he has responded to the teachings of God and to the ways of God. Now that's what Paul is teaching those Christians then. That's what Paul is teaching Christians even yet today. And then he says, For as many as have sinned without law, that is, they didn't have a written law like the Jew, the law of Moses, shall also perish without law. They may have had the law, but they have to obey the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Here's the way men will be judged. For not the hearers of the law are just before God. Here again is obedience. But the doers of the law shall be justified. And I want to emphasize here that the system of salvation includes law. Sometimes people get the idea that because we're under the grace of God, and we most certainly are, we dare not minimize it, that this displaces all law and therefore obedience is not necessary. That's false. The system of salvation is a system of law, and it must be obeyed in faith. And that's the teaching of the Apostle Paul about the way God saves man. And he said, for when the Gentiles which have not the law, they didn't have the law of Moses, they didn't have a written law, I know they had a law, because there can't be sin if there's no law. I remember years ago I was driving through Kansas, and I saw a sign on the highway, no speed limit. Oh, I was tempted, but I was afraid my little Chevrolet couldn't do it. But I was driving by 70, 75, and sure enough, here's a fella that passed me. He believed it. Man, he was roaring down the highway. I don't care how fast he's going. He couldn't violate the law unless he ran over me. That wouldn't have been nice. But you, you, can't, you can't sin if there's no law to violate. And we know that there was sin since the time of Adam. Therefore, they had a law. It wasn't a written law, but down through the ages, God has spoken to man and spoken to man through his prophets, spoken to man through the patriarchs, and he has given his law to mankind. The people before Moses had a law. The people before the Israelites had a law. It wasn't a written law like the law of Moses was, but they had a law nonetheless. And he says, when, uh, for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, and by nature means by their repeated habit, 
They were doing things that would show obedience to the law of Moses if it had applied to them. And having not a law, they are a law unto themselves. They realized there was a law. They realized there was an oughtness. There are things we ought to do and there are things that we ought not. And he said, the Gentiles, the law, and verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean, the standard, while accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The gospel teaches us that Christ is going to be the one through whom God is going to judge all men. Now he won't judge all men by the gospel. Those that live prior to the gospel will not be judged by the gospel. But those that live since Pentecost, that's when the law of the gospel is applicable. And he will judge by the gospel. But he is teaching here now the Jew, they had a written law. But you're supposed to obey that law. The Gentile, they didn't have a written law, but they had a law. And how they had received that law and what all that law might have contained, it's not revealed to us, but the fact that they sinned showed that they did have a law. Three, uh, Romans 4 and verse 15 shows that without a law, you can't sin. But they sinned, so they had a law. It was a law that was written, if you please, on their heart. It might not have been in the law of Moses on the, the, uh, the scrolls like the Jews had, but they had a law nonetheless. Now notice, notice the attitude that the Jew at this time had. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth, that is, you lean on the law, and makest thy boast of God. Oh, they had a history with God. They had received a law from God. God had spared them all down through the ages and knowest his will and approvest, that is, you put to the test the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Oh, we've been educated. We know the law. Others don't have the law like we have. We have had a historical re uh, relationship with God. That makes us somewhat. But now notice, verse 19, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth of the law. Therefore, thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest not thyself, Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Oh, the Jew, because of their background and association with God, we're the one to tell you what's right. We're the ones to guide you. We're the ones to instruct you in the ways of God. And Paul says, hold back now just a minute. You think that's true, but if you teach one thing and you turn right around and do that very thing, you think that's acceptable? Those of you who teach that uh, uh, you are not to steal, do you steal? He said in verse 22, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thy God? The Gentiles often brought dishonor upon God by the way that they lived because they claimed to be God's people. Now let's get this lesson for ourselves. They claimed to be God's people, but they weren't living like God's people and people therefore dishonored God because those people were living in a sinful fashion. And Paul is condemning that inconsistency and that hypocrisy and that disobedience. Now we've got about 30 seconds and I don't know whether I can cover these last verses that quick or not. For circumcision, now that was the sign of the relationship 
with God of the Israelite nation since the time of Abraham for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law what's he stressing obedience but if thou be a breaker of the law thy circumcision is made circumcision you just soon not been circumcised if you're going to break the law therefore if the uncircumcision that's the Gentile keep the righteousness of the law shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision the Gentile who was not circumcised and was not commanded to be circumcised if he obeyed the law why that was just as good as those who had been circumcised and he says here and shall not uncircumcision which is by nature and that is by habit if it fulfill the law obe obedience judge do who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law now notice how he uses the word Jew in verse 28 he's not talking about a nationality he's not talking about an ethnic blood uh, uh, relationship he's talking about a spiritual Jew he's talking about one who is one of God's chosen he says but he is a Jew Oh, if he is not a Jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh well who's a Jew but he is a Jew one of God's which is one inwardly and the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God the circumcision of the heart is the cutting away of sins from the soul and Colossians chapter 2 tells us that's an operation of God and God performs that operation when we are baptized baptism is not the circumcision but the circumcision the cutting away of our sins does take place at baptism and that's when God performs the circumcision and that's the one who is a true blue spiritual Jew and those who claim to be God's people because of a fleshly relationship they're no longer God's chosen people when he speaks of the letter he's speaking of the old law when he speaks of the spirit he's talking about following after the gospel of Christ I believe I heard the bell did I? why oh, I'm coming to the top first time I've heard a bell and I don't know how long. <laughs>